Welcome back to Football Daily, where today we're talking about Chelsea. We're talking about Graham Potter's Blues because, my goodness, are they struggling. Not only are they comfortably mid-table, they've won one of their last 10 games, two in 14. Since November the 6th, they've scored six goals. Six goals since November the 6th. In that time, Manchester United have scored 50. We've also had over a month now of seeing how the new January editions, over £300 million worth of January editions, have fitted in to this Graham Potter Chelsea system. In fact, we've had over seven months of seeing some of the signings made in the summer window. So today, we are going to be ranking the Chelsea signings made so far under Todd Burley and the Clear Lake era. So as you can see in front of me, I've got four categories. We've got Future Star, we've got a player that's been a solid signing, players that have been poor signings, and total whiffs. Stinkers. We're starting with Raheem Sterling, who was, of course, signed for £47.5 million from Manchester City. At the time, me and the majority of the footballing world thought this was an exceptional bit of business by Chelsea. Still only 28 years old, but he hasn't really had the impact I was expecting him to have on this Chelsea side. He hasn't scored the goals I was expecting him to score. Just the four goals, two assists so far. He's obviously had that hamstring problem consistently at Chelsea. I'm going to have to kind of look into the future a little bit with some of these signings, aren't I? I'm not going to be able to just say what they've done this season. I'm going to have to think whether or not in the future it's going to work. I do think the Raheem Sterling is a solid signing. It's not working right now, but not much is at Chelsea. They desperately need to find a coherent front line and stick with it. There's too much chopping and changing, and that does come down to the fact the squad is way too bloated. 31 players in a squad cannot run. They can't even put on training sessions with 31 players, let alone pick a consistent 11. They need to find a solid front three that consistently scores goals, and I think Raheem Sterling should be part of that. Next up, we've got Kaladu Koulibaly, 31 years old, signed for £34 million from Napoli, who have got exponentially better since he's left, by the way. Um, he's got a contract till 2026, so a long old time left. He's on massive wages. I think now you look back on it, this is just a total whiff. I think some people, I remember I had Theo on Saturday Social at the start of the season, and he had him down as his signing of the summer. I think at the time... Quite a lot of us at Football Daily were quite sceptical about it, and now it just looks really problematic. With Benoit Badiashile filling that left centre-back role, you know, you've got Wesley Fafana, you've got Thiago Silva, you've got Trevor Chalobah, you've got Levi Colwell out on loan. Where's the need for Kaladu Koulibaly? There's no resale value. It's going to be extremely hard to shift him off the books because of the wages, the length of the contract, and the age. It doesn't fit in with this new narrative of Chelsea recruitment of young players that are going to become future superstars on long contracts. This was a Todd Burley signing. This was pre-recruitment team disaster. Let's go next to Carney Chukwameka, who I am actually going to put down as a future star. Every time I watch him, he's really, really impressive. I think he should have got more than the 196 minutes I've seen so far of him this season. I think he's been underused by Graham Potter. I would like to see him get given a chance in the attacking midfield role if he's going to persist with this four at the back system. I don't think he's going to. So in the summer, I would be looking to get Carney Chukwameka a loan move because quite frankly, he's not getting the game time his talent deserves. Mark Kukurea up next then. 24 years old, signed for a world record fullback fee of £63 million. At the time, we all thought it was a bit bizarre. I still think it's bizarre now. You know, at the time, Chelsea fans made the argument consistently to me on social media. Well, he can play left wing back, he can play left back, he can play left centre back. That was an argument for a while. They've gone out and signed Benoit Badiashile. They've got Levi Colwell on loan. You know, they've got Kaladu Koulibaly, even though I put him down in whiff and play that role too. They don't need him to play left centre back. He's not offered nearly enough going forward. Nowhere near. Two assists so far and I think 24 appearances for Chelsea this season. He's just not as good as Ben Chilwell either. I think this has been a poor signing. There's time for him to change it around because he's still only 24. He's working with a coach he's consistently worked with for years at Brighton. Do I see him turning it around? Right now, no. I think he's a lucky boy to have started as many games as he has this season. Cesar Casadai, who's obviously 
got to be in the future star category. He's only on loan at Reading at the moment. Bought in for a not cheap fee, by the way. 16.5 million pounds from Inter Milan. He is massive. If you're watching him play, he, he's huge. Uh, don't really know where else I can put him because you couldn't say Solis signing hasn't really had an impact and hasn't been given the chance to go in either of these categories. So I'm putting him in future star. Wesley Fofana is an interesting one, isn't he? Because, you know, he's arrived for such a big fee. I think it was £75 million from Leicester. Virgil van Dijk numbers. And he is still just 22 years old. An extremely highly rated and highly talented centre-back. But... You know, there were large question marks about his injury history at Leicester when he broke his ankle. Was he going to be able to refine the form? Because Chelsea did take a little bit of a gamble spending that money when they hadn't seen him play for a full season recovered. He's come in. He's had two knee injuries already. The injury history continues to plague him, but he is still just 22 years old. When I watch him, I still think he's an immensely talented centre-back. So I will put him in future star, just... But the injury problems would concern me. And the fact he's got such a long contract till 2029 would concern me. You know, if the injury problems continue for a player like Wesley Fofana and he's not able to get out on the field, what do you do with a player who's got a contract for 2029? You are stuck with an asset. And this is part of the issue for me for giving these players really long contracts. I totally understand the amortization and they're trying to get around FFP by giving them the contracts. They can spread the fee across that length. But what happens if a player picks up consistent injuries? What happens if a player never finds form at that club? What happens if the player, you know, explodes and wants a new contract? You've got to give him a new contract. Then it's, for me, there's a reason it's not been done before. I'm going to put him in future star because I think there is talent there, but the injuries worry me. Next up, we've got Wesley's namesake, David Datro for Fana. Hmm. Now, I think I'm going to put him in solid signing. He's only had 60 minutes of football since he's come to Chelsea. I actually was quite impressed with him in that first half. I think it was against Southampton before he got hooked at half time. I thought that was a pretty undeserved substitution by Graham Potter, but whatever. He's trying to find a front line that works. I just cannot believe that the plan to bring a talented player who was scoring a bucket load of goals at Mulder to the club in the January window was then not to send him out alone or have some sort of development plan for him other than him sitting on the bench for 95% of the minutes this season. You know, he's played 62 minutes so far since he's joined the club. Was that the plan? To bring David Datcher of Fana a 20 role to the club for, you know, 15 odd million pounds and have him sit on the bench for six months? Be part of a training group that's 31 players big? I don't know. Again, the, the planning for me is bizarre. Next up, we've got Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, who cost 10 million pounds in Barcelona. I mean, we have to put it in total whiff, don't we? What was the point? What was the point in bringing Aubameyang in? Clearly, this was a Todd Burley Clear Lake signing, and Thomas Tuchel would have signed off it at the time. He doesn't fit into Graham Potter's system, or at least Graham Potter doesn't want him. You know, we keep hearing the noises that, oh, he's training really well, he's super professional. Well, he's not included in the Champions League squad. You can't buy a minute of Premier League football. At this stage, with six goals scored since November the 6th, you may as well give him a go at nine. I, I, can it get any worse through the middle? Can it actually get any worse? Nobody can score a goal. I would probably have given him like one or two games. And, you know, if his attitude is as good as everybody has said at Chelsea on the training ground, then why not just throw him in? Surely he's a better goal scorer than Kai Havertz at this stage. I don't get it. I, I really don't get it. But I didn't get a sign at the time. It was, you know, Thomas Tuchel scratching around, scrambling around for a striker. And they ended up with Pierre and Kabami and Barcelona must be rubbing their hands. Another just bizarre bit of planning from the Todd Burley Clear Lake administration, in my opinion. Next up, we've got Benoit Badia-Shield, straight into future star. For me, the best signing of the January window for Chelsea by some distance. Maybe the best signing of any of the players I've seen Todd Burley and clearly it makes so far. I feel like he's had an instant impact at Chelsea despite his young age. He looks like he's immediately ready for Premier League football. Extraordinarily unlucky. Unlucky? Unlucky not to make the Champions League squad. I think he's a fabulous player. I think he's got everything to partner Thiago Silva in the short term and in the long term partner Wesley Fofana and be an exceptional centre-back for Chelsea. Dennis Zakaria. I mean, he had a couple of good games. He actually was starting to find his feet and looking like he was going to be a solid signing. But he's been injured. He's picked up an injury at the worst possible time for Chelsea when they needed midfield reinforcements. He hasn't been there because of that injury. And because he's only on loan, he has to then drop into the poor signing category. He's only started four games. Admittedly, 
you know, two of those starts, I thought he was one of their better players. And it looked like he was really growing into the Chelsea shirt. And if he had continued that form, I would definitely have had him in solid signing. And if he goes across the next half of the season and suddenly picks up mad form, it's been a solid signing. It was a cheap fee. You know, they're probably not going to make it permanent, but whatever. But right now, he's just not impacting games because he's injured and he's only alone. So he's got no future at the club. So it is a poor signing. Andre Santos. I mean, he hasn't even got a work permit, has he? He's going out on loan, isn't he? So let's just put him in future star. Massively hyped in Brazil, but I haven't watched any of the Brazilian league to see it. Next up, we've got Mikhailo Mudrik. I mean, he is a future star, isn't he? Like, from what everybody has told me that's watched the Ukrainian first division, and when I saw him in the Champions League, he did look like a future star. When he had space to run into, when he could face defenders at 1v1, he looked like a future star. At the moment, he's struggling a little bit to adapt to the Premier League physically. It's not easy when you come from the Ukrainian top tier and you're asked to immediately have an impact in games. But that's absolutely fine. The adaptation period, he should be allowed six months, a year to adapt to England, adapt to how Chelsea want to play. He's playing in a constantly shifting back three with no consistency in the midfield four, with no consistency as a left back. It's just all up in the air. It's the most difficult situation for a player to embed himself into a new league, especially when you're coming from the Ukrainian division where it's a massive step up. Give Mudrik time. Even if he goes 007, which is, you know, likely to happen, it's fine. Just please give Mudrik some time. I just think that everything at Chelsea is so pressurised right now. They need to find a consistent side consistent front three and even if that means Mudrik starting from the bench and coming in and rotating occasionally that's better than the constant chopping and changing of styles and formations and 11s that we're seeing right now. Next up is Noni Madueke. I think I'm going to put him in solid signing. It's harsh he could probably be in future star but I just don't really know where the space is for him in this side. Especially if Raheem Sterling is fit and firing and wants to play on that right-hand side. Mudrik's playing on the left-hand side. You know, Mason Mount's got to fit in there. Kai Havertz's got to fit in there. There's Pulisic and Ziyech, who, quite frankly, why Ziyech still getting minutes when he was trying to be shipped off to PSG at the end of the window? In fact, that basically happened and fell through. I don't get it. I don't get a lot of things that are going on at Chelsea, to be honest with you. It felt like maybe that was one winger too many. Do you know what? Uh, yeah, I'm going to leave him in solid signing. I think, I think he will be fine for them. This brings us on to Joao Felix. Trying to pronounce that well because I, I watched him do an interview the other day and it is just rude to mispronounce people's names. And it is Joao Felix, not Joao Felix. Apologies, Joao. And this is a really interesting one. This is probably the most interesting of the lot for me because he's a fabulous player. I think he's an absolutely incredible talent. What he can do with the ball at his feet, not many other players of his age can do when his touch is perfect. His ability to shift pace and move the game along is incredible. But he costs £9 million. And for £9 million, you need to have an impact on a team that either takes them to Champions Leagues, takes them to Champions League spots, takes them to league titles, takes them to FA Cups, takes them to league... Has to have an impact that is noticeable on either a league position or a trophy. For £9 million... Joao Felix is not going to do that. They're going to finish somewhere between 10th and 6th, maybe 10th and 5th. So they're not going to get Champions League. They're not going to win the Champions League. They're not going to win an FA Cup. And they're out of the FA Cup. They're not going to win the League Cup. Obviously, United have already won that. So I think it's a poor signing. I, there's no point in it. it. You may as well give that role uh, to a younger player that is at Chelsea for the long term that can develop into that position. I think it's extremely unlikely they're able to retain Joao Felix next summer unless they spend 150 million euros to do it and get him out of Atletico Madrid. If that's the case, then that position changes. But as we speak today, he signed a contract extension at Atletico Madrid. There's no option to buy. There's no obligation to buy. So he actually has come for nine, 10 million pounds to play well, but to play well for what? There's no end goal. So for me, you may as well have given those minutes to a youngster. Malo Gusto, obviously he hasn't even joined yet. He joins in the summer. Let's just put him in future star. Massively hyped in league. And I was listening to Euro Expert the other day on Twitter, talking just about how fantastic this lad has been this season at Lyon. And Enzo Fernandez, 
who, yeah, future star. I think he needs a bit more time to adapt as well. I don't think he's actually started quite as well as I thought he would, but again, it's not really a fault of his. He's never got a consistent partner alongside him. He's being asked to play as a single pivot, the deepest man in midfield, which I don't think suits his skill set massively. Players are able to run off him. I think there's no player in Europe's top five leagues since he's come to Chelsea that's being dribbled past more per game than Enzo Fernandez. He's being dribbled past on average three times per 90 in a Chelsea shirt. He's just not an out-and-out -out DM. I think when Kante comes back and can play alongside him, you'll see the best of Enzo Fernandez. He's certainly going to be a future star. But overall, what I think you can see here from this list is there's a real mix of quality. And the players that were signed in the original summer window, Hula Bali, Aubameyang, Kukurea, Denis Sicaria have big question marks hanging over them. And it's no surprise because those signings were made without a clear recruitment structure in place, without a clear plan, with one manager who then left five, six games into the season. These sort of players, it's just bizarre, man. It's really bizarre. But Chelsea fans, I want to hear from you. Do you agree with me? Do you not agree with me? What's your take on the Joao Felix situation? Do you think I've been a little bit harsh there because he is such an amazingly talented player? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button, hit subscribe. Thanks very much for watching, everybody. We'll see you later.